Welcome everybody um, to our webinar tonight. We have Silva Pastor in Supply Chain Food Safety with Ray He at the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance. And I just have one more slide to share with everyone and then I'll turn it over to Ray He if I can get my slide to go. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. At the very end, we're going to save about 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers. And you can either unmute yourself, which nobody's really been doing, but feel free to do that and ask the question to Rehi directly. Or if you prefer, you can just type it into the questions section, the comment section, and I will read it off. And for anyone who's not familiar with the Savannah Institute, I just wanted to give a brief introduction of who we are that we are hosting this tonight. Um, and also, my name is Michelle. I'm the event coordinator for the, for the Savannah Institute. So the mission of the Savannah Institute is to lay the groundwork for widespread agroforestry in the Midwest. We work in collaboration with farmers and scientists to develop perennial food and fodder crops within multifunctional polyculture systems that are grounded in ecology and inspired by the Savannah biome. The Savannah Institute strategically enacts this mission via research, education, and outreach. And if you're interested in becoming more involved, you can involved, you can visit our website, join us at our other webinars, which is listed on our website, download our free tree book called Planting Tree Crops, or you can support our organization through donations. So I will stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to Reiki. So I think you can go ahead and just share your screen. Thank you, doing that, appreciate that. Okay, is that good? I can see it. And now I can't see the bottom. Okay, let me just go to my, there we go. Okay, is that good now? Perfect. Oh, Great. well, Thanks we can see like your side part where it says next slide or no notes. So we'd be able to see your notes if you had any. Uh, okay, uh, let me see. What do I do here? I think I do, um, not that, not that. I know that there was a trick that, uh, okay, not that. Oh. Is it at the top, the display settings? Yes. Stop this interview and slideshow, duplicate slideshow. There. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you. And um, just uh, to get started, um, if you want to send some Hold on, there is some subtitling that is very distracting. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if you want to send me a note afterwards, feel free to ask me questions. Uh, that's my direct email, reggie at regionagalliance.org. And I'll do my best to, to respond. I do also have a PDF um, general introduction to the regenerative poultry system, which doesn't go through a lot of the details you will see today but um, gives you a good grounding. And if you are interested in this poultry system after today, that, that would help. I am also working on a larger publication. It's a 14 chapter publication uh, called the Regenerative Poultry Compendium. I mean, it is a poultry compendium. So that would have really everything that, that I can pour into a single document. So with that in mind, uh, let me just walk you through a overview of this system and we'll do it with the in, within the context of both biosecurity and food safety. And um, I'm not going to be speaking about food safety regulations or any of that, uh, but we have designed a system that does meet every regulation there is. We don't violate any laws in the process uh, of uh, what we do and not even the laws of thermodynamics. In fact, the laws of thermodynamics are the foundation of the engineering of what we do. So with that in mind, uh, let me get started here by first establishing the, a definition for something that you will hear me say a lot, the term decolonization. Uh, it's simply a process that results in the transformation of ownership and control and governing uh, structures that perpetuate the extraction, appropriation, destruction, expropriation, and extermination of life on earth while validating such actions in the name of development. That is truly the biggest challenge we are facing today is, uh, is that the way we have colonized everything we do. And because of that, we tend to always seek these kinds of, um, uh, unleash this kind of human traits. And as a result of that, uh, we are destroying the planet, destroying our livelihood, destroying our, our possibilities of survival. 
that is done because of the way we colonize and the way our minds operate and design things. So the only antidote we know to that is the ancient cultures of indigenous ways of thinking. So the indigenization that I will talk about is really a process of self and collective conscientization that results in a way of seeing, comprehending, studying, interacting and working with the earth's natural systems and with each other uh, based on an identity that reflects our dependency on natural living systems, a process by which we come to own our responsibility to preserve, to respect, and to protect the evolutionary processes that generated the conditions that allow the emergence of life in the first place, and that the same ones will ensure the preservation of the diversity of life on the planet for as long as the earth exists. That is fundamentally the difference between a colonization mentality and an indigenous mentality. Indigenous not meant as native communities, but rather as all of us being indigenous to the earth. Everyone can be, can process things from an indigenous perspective. And then some of us will be native to certain regions of the world. So that's, that's critical. Uh, as we go forward, you will find both of these concepts fully embedded in the, not only the logical framework used to produce these kinds of engineering, but also in the application of science, technology, and all kinds of pretty modern um, uh, tools and resources that we have. Uh, decolonizing doesn't mean you get rid of what we have. It just means you reorganize it for a different purpose and a different outcome rather than extraction, appropriation, and destruction of life. Okay, so having said that, let's move on to some more mundane things. So first of all, we operate in agriculture. So that means the carbon cycle is our most and most, in the, our most important and in the, indispensable resource. It is our true currency. And it is what allows the, the ecosystem to regenerate and it has allowed it for, for millions of years. Um, energy management is the foundation of efficiency in agriculture, not output. Output is in terms of bushels per acre and stuff like that, pounds per acre or whatever. Those are not uh, measurements of, of efficiency. Those are measurements of output or yield. Efficiency really in agriculture is the the difference between energy that goes into the, the, into the process and energy that comes out and is harvested uh, in edible forms. So because of that, <clears throat> then, then the, the foundation of production engineering and management and the sciences in regenerative, in regenerative agronomics really is the, uh, the working with naturally existing energy transformation systems. And those are the systems that have evolved for billions of years and that allowed that, um, that natural uh, evolution that over geological time uh, created this absolutely magnificent and sophisticated ways that nature turns carbon in the air, dioxide, carbon dioxide in the air into, you know, sugars and other things that then are transformed into cellulose and into apples and chickens and feathers and all of the things that we see. So basically uh, that is fundamental to the, this engineering and management science that we have uh, generated to produce this agronomics and the result being this regenerative poultry system. The integration of collective, local, regional, and national enterprise systems is the key to achieving a competitive advantage. Too frequently, uh, when we design community projects, we are looking at competitiveness as in, how do we un undo the neighbor or the, or, the, or the market next door or take over the market or stuff like that that is the expression of a colonized mind at work. The integration of local and collective and collective systems allows us to decolonize our mind so we can see our interdependence. And like I said at the beginning, our relationship with each other as the, uh, the key to achieving that competitive advantage. Competitive advantage against what is the key to understand too. And that, by that I mean a uh, competitive advantage against the system that is colonizing and destroying the planet. That's what we are uh, compete with not each other, not other producers, not other brands that are actually representative of that indigenization that we are talking about. And that is technically the most fundamental and more concise definition of an insurgency, which is the foundation of revolutions. And it is exactly what we need in order to change the agricultural landscape today. So all of this has been designed not only with 
the uh, agronomics and the biophysics and the laws of thermodynamics and the understanding of carbon and all of that, and the understanding of carbon and nitrogen uh, compounds in the, in, the, in the context of climate change, but also the understanding of how we structure systems and economic infrastructure and management infrastructure to either colonize or to collectively achieve larger and more comprehensive and more um, healthy outcomes. Okay, so how does this work? Well, <clears throat> we're gonna portray this, we're gonna take this system, this theory, and turn it into an actual uh, uh, farming operation centered on the chicken. Why the chicken? I'll tell you another day. The chicken is really the choice of our um, approach because uh, fundamentally is a global common denominator uh, for bringing together every farmer that, uh, whether it's large, medium, or small, but especially the small farmers. So basically the chicken is, allows us to engineer from an, a structural, and, and eliminate the, the, the structural discrimination that exists in colonizing uh, processes. Technically the chicken allows us to decolonize and indigenize a an engineering blueprint at a much faster uh, pace and deploy it globally at a much faster speed as well. And that's why we chose poultry, mostly because it's compatible with the oppressed populations of the world. Second thing is that chicken is a jungle animal. So by definition, we're gonna raise it outdoors, free range as it was supposed to be, but under a jungle. Uh, and within that jungle, building an ecosystem that is compatible with a geoevolutionary blueprint of the chicken, which is expressed in the biodiversity of its gut and in the biodiversity of what it eats, uh, which is mostly forages with high protein, low fiber, and bugs, 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 bugs. So those, those two components allow us to unleash the microbiology of the soil that, it, you know, once I tell you the stories behind what we are harvesting now from those uh, fields where the chickens roam, uh, it blows our own minds and, and we are used to really good yields and high quality products and every year we see something that still go we go like wow we didn't know the chickens could do that and that's because we are regenerating that biology which technically is if you think of the world as a whole um, and you and you and you think from an indigenous perspective not as a producer but see, if you're a farmer but rather as a as an energy steward, where you take energy from non-edible into edible forms, and it's happening out there in front of your eyes in nature. If you think of, 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 of nature as a whole, the digestive system of the earth is really the, the collective aggregation of the intestinal tracts of all of the organisms, all the way from that little worm that turns your, your kitchen scraps into, into solid and incredible uh, soil aggregates within a, a few hours, 48 hours, two, three days, um, you know, the, all of those organisms combined, their intestinal tract it are really the digestive system of the earth. And so just like our own intestinal tract is the digestive system of our body, we are collectively the digestive system of the earth. And so if, because of that, it's the organisms in the soil, the health of the soil, is the foundation of the transformation of all of the rest of the energy in, expressed in the form of nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, and all of the other nutrients, micronutrients, trace elements, and all of that, that in agriculture engineering, we have to consider when uh, designing systems. So out of this initial process, we, we harvest the first layer of energy, which comes in the form of um, fruits and, and uh, meat and eggs and uh, hazelnuts in our case, because we use hazelnuts as as the shade for the trees, but also elderberries. And today we're harvesting aronia, which it's amazing, you know, how different aronia is producing where the chickens roam versus where there is no, no, no chickens. And the chickens never bother them, which is a really, really good thing. Or maybe not, it depends. You know, when an animal won't eat a, something, you gotta wonder whether you should too. But I guess aronias are, are okay to eat. They have been uh, eaten for, many hundreds, of, actually thousands of years by the natives. Uh, but the energy cycles don't stop there. Once you harvested that part of that energy, there is more energy. There is manure, there is feathers, there's giblets, there's all kinds of expressions of energy that, that came in the form of feed at the beginning that are still in need of further transformation. So we move this not 
we, we move this outside of the, of the areas where the chickens grow, uh, where we raise the chickens, so we can put them into a new process of transformation where we watch over bacteria content. If there's salmonella in this manure, we're going to allow for it to balance back out. Uh, not, I'm not talking about traditional composting. I'll show you how we do this. Uh, we don't like to use heat um, in the process. And so we have to be careful with the, the way we manage the manure so that it's actually uh, meeting the, uh, the, the, the food safety standards and all kinds of things. But basically we don't want it heated so that we don't lose a lot of the good quality nutrients and again, carbon and, and, and money, literally currency that we are trying to manage here. Microbiology, especially fungi, are critical in this process. And so we can generate a new kind of harvest of energy in the form of grains, vegetables, uh, medicinal herbs, you name it. Uh, we are growing a lot of diversity uh, on outside of the paddocks where there is no chickens, but it's still uh, powered completely by the chicken 100%. Uh, that ends up on our plate. So if you look at this plate, you will think um, uh, carrots, you know, broccoli, peas, or whatever, potatoes, whatever we put on the plate. If you look at it from an indigenous mind, you, what you will see is expressions of energy in highly organized forms uh, that we call carrots and we call other things. But they are simply organization or energy organized in different expressions, just like we ourselves are a highly organized uh, form of energy that has organs, has brains, uh, can speak and all of that. But at the end of the day, we are simply a very highly organized form of energy. Uh, that part of that energy, the, the grains and you know, leftovers from the kitchens and all of that can go right back into the system. And so the cycle of energy can continue. Basically, we are energy management managers, and that is the foundation of efficiency in agriculture. An efficiency that is measured by the fact that we only harvest in average about 30 to 40% of the energy, while 70% of the energy that was taken literally out of thin air uh, goes back into the system to capitalize the next cycle of energy and that way it regenerates perpetually. The end result really is a landscape that not only looks beautiful, but is also uh, highly productive. And I can, I can give you some data if you want to as to the higher levels of productivity we can achieve. In terms of economic value, we are harvesting upwards of 20 to 30 times the value of an acre of corn and soybeans, just to give you an idea. Now in volumes, we are also harvesting many times, up to three times more volume of um, output, if you want to measure it with traditional measuring tools uh, in terms of the weight of the chicken, the weight of the other uh, products that we are, uh, other energy forms that we are harvesting out of that space where the chickens roam. <clears throat> to give you back to how this works, uh, this is a, just a brooding space. If any of you have raised chickens, you will know what this is just a rondelle with the chickens uh, cooked up for four days. Um, after uh, five days, I mean, uh, they, they stay within the brooding system for four weeks. After the first five days, we open them up to the bigger space of the coop uh, and then uh, expand their space um, until they reach four weeks. Uh, meanwhile, the outdoors are being prepared when there is no perennial crops yet. We use uh, annual crops to create a uh, canopy that is critical for the protection of of the chicken, but also for the cooling of the ground, the germination of grain, and the growing of forages, and also so that they don't suffer when in the summer when um, the, 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 the sun comes out and they get scared and don't want to be outside. Uh, after, after four weeks, they start roaming. We rotate them back and forth between two paddocks, and we feed them all kinds of uh, diverse forages, including a lot of grain. You can see some of those grain, um, that are barley on the, on the foreground there. Um, that is put down so that they can, can eat that too as a supplement. They clean up the underbrush and um, there's still green stuff here. You can't just see it because it's, it's far enough. But, but basically they maintain their own space. Uh, when it rains, we really rejoice because then everything takes off like wild. And then we, the chickens get a lot more foraging. And that saves us a lot of um, uh, resources on the, um, on the feed supply also produce a significant amount of, of um, outputs. Uh, in this case, uh, sunflowers that are then fed back to the chickens so we could harvest them and turn them into people food. Whatever we want to do there, 
We have also alternated with corn uh, year after year, so we don't plant the same uh, thing. When, while the perennial crops develop, we can use this for these annual crops. Um, it's other hazelnuts now more developed, so less of that annual, those annual um, crops. Chickens fully grown, hazelnuts being harvested out of that same space, wood chipping, biomass being harvested out of that same space. Uh, this is the sign of, of an actual farm. This is four production units on the bottom, alley cropping systems above. Uh, all the manure from the poultry then, uh, the poultry coops then spread out and used to fertilize the rest of the farm. This is out of Pebble, Minnesota. Uh, these are the production units at that same farm. Uh, still in the early development, uh, the hazelnuts are caged to protect them from the chickens, but they are weeded and fertilized. We spread them out, spread them out evenly by spreading grain strategically and moving the feeders around so that they would forage and clean up and weed and fertilize the whole space. The fence is taller than we need for broilers because we, these are, this is an egg laying unit that we are using for broilers right now, but we'll put egg layers later. So the units are, the ranging area is bigger and the fences are taller. Uh, the manure from the, from the buildings are put through layering, uh, 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 comp layering composting piles, no more than a foot height so that they don't heat. And that way we feed fungal communities and create the space where the, the following year we can grow our vegetable forests, we call them. Uh, the kids from the school that come out call the Sue's, uh, Dr. Sue's forest, even the, the Swiss chard just grew about twice as big as it was growing where there were no, no where we, we didn't use the, the poultry manure. Uh, tomatoes that are actually sticky from the amount of um, of protection they have built around themselves, the, what we call the, um, the, the, the building up of that uh, uh, shield, those shields that they build over uh, themselves to protect themselves against uh, predators, especially because of the, you know, all the uh, pests that we get around here. We never applied any, not even organic uh, pest controls or anything. Um, squash, um, I mean pumpkins, uh, this is squash combined with corn and medicinal herbs. Uh, if you look closer, you will see the cilantro picking through, the sage and uh, other herbs that, and, and that we are growing in there. Or traditional, you know, row crop vegetables uh, completely supported by the, uh, all of this completely supported 100% uh, just by the poultry manure. Uh, some of the best black beans we have grown I mean, of course, black beans fix their own nitrogen, but they, they still grow better uh, with the rotation, um, with rotations with other crops like garlic in this case, again, 100% fertilized with our poultry manure. Um, because we've got so much diversity as part of the system, we also get to support two to three beehives um, in two acres that we uh, operate right here outside of Northfield. Um, the hazelnuts, of course, are the, the, the next main crop because they are raised grown by the chickens themselves. Uh, this last uh, few years, five years, we have been harvest, harvesting record number of hazelnuts. And we have, when we have interns, we, we make it a point to, to grow and to cook 100% farm meals so that nothing is coming from outside, including the corn tortillas in the center of the table that we make from the corn race right here. While the chickens are rotated and the new crop uh, gets to grow in the brooding, the paddocks regenerate and the cycle starts all over again and on and on it goes. So let me show you something quick here. This is a, a video from last week, right before we processed the, the flock that uh, just harvested uh, over the weekend. Um, these are your full grown hazelnuts. Uh, we will be harvesting those hazelnut bushes in about two weeks. Uh, we expect another record uh, harvest as um, one flock is 1,500 birds and um, we rotate them back and forth because they really eat up everything towards the last part of their days. Um, right here you see a elderberry plant. We kind of cut this one down quite a bit. Uh, the other ones are fully grown and the other paddock we just finished harvesting the elderberries. Today my wife was finishing harvesting the the uh, aronias, 
just a few trees there, but they were so loaded. We, we had a handful of uh, one gallon buckets, um, almost two buckets per bush. This, um, this is an area here. You can see the corn on the background. That's on the other side of the fence where they will rotate, where they rotated from. And in two days, they go to the processor. Some of those chickens, we kept them here and we invited the community. We have these West African communities that have moved into Southern Minnesota. And we had a day of processing chickens, very affordable for the price of conventional chicken. They can take a, a lot of value home because they can take the giblets and all of that, which together is almost 25 to $30. Uh, they can just pay nine, $10. We get paid really well. And they take almost $30 of retail value home. Totally worth it, the $12, $20 difference per chicken that's worth coming out to the farm for and, and feeding their families. As far as um, other forms of processing, we, we bought a pol mobile poultry processing unit, which is now deployed in Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, very um, you know, state certifiable. This one was not USDA certifiable, but totally state certifiable. And um, is now processing chickens in, for the native community in Pine Ridge. There are other forms of them. This is a, a mobile unit. Uh, manufactured by Cornerstone Ventures. And, um, you know, branding critical for this as we develop the protocols and build the supply chain. Uh, branding was critical for the system, so we put a name to it. It was really easy since these are chickens raised under the, the ag agroforestry system. Um, just quickly on an economic profile, this is not about farms only, it's also about how we aggregate and create uh, value added and, and supply chain. So our minimum indicator here of success is 200 production units. Uh, you do the math between six and eight or 10 production units per farm. It could be 25 farms or 50 farms. Uh, right now we are targeting 20 farms and this in the next 12 months, we plan to deploy 10 farms in Southeastern Minnesota of which we have five already in production. Uh, the total wholesale value of uh, production from a cluster is approximately $22 million. Um, the value gate for the um, farm, farm gate value for the farmer or farmer income is just around 13 million. If you want to do the math in terms of distribution of, of that value. Hazelnuts, we figured about $10 million worth of value as we reach uh, over uh, 1 million uh, trees. Uh, right now we're starting that process of planting 1 million. Uh, we are about 60,000. So we're just in the beginning of that. Uh, building extra value for farmers as well. Uh, engaging around 7,000 acres. That's our goal. Um, we're moving really fast into that with a total aggregated cluster impact to around $32 million. That's without counting a lot of the vegetables and the other things that are also part of the cluster development. Um, a total of 1.7 million uh, birds per cluster allows us to support a processing facility. And so to that point, the, we just purchased a processing facility that was idling in Stacyville, Iowa, right on the border. And so we are now engaging the three states, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota border region farmers. Uh, we plan to process just under uh, 500,000 broilers there. So that allows us to create a jumping point to create a light industrial park in southeastern Minnesota. So we can do at least one and a half and then up to 10 million um, birds for the region. Uh, by deploying a series of small scale farms. This is just a quick view so you know that we have a very strict protocol for how this is done. That protocol allows us to implement fully um, biosecurity measures across the farms. And in 12 years, we have had no incidents of cross-contamination between farms. And that is part, partially because of the way not only the birds are managed, but also the way the interaction between farms and the way people are trained fully to be professionally managing this, these aspects. Um, really aggregating enterprise sectors is our, our goal for the region, uh, starting with eggs and, and meat, and then aggregating fish production because of the um, uh, you know, trout streams and the fact that trout grows and trout is a, uh, is a uh, meat eating um, uh, fish, which can eat and process all of the byproducts from the processing facilities. The uh, same way we process byproducts from the gardens by feeding them to chickens. Instead of composting them, we put them into chickens. In 48 hours, we can have a processed uh, lettuce, head of lettuce, rather than waiting nine months for it to decompose in a composting pile. And that way we get more production out of it and more energy transformation. That uh, 
processing of uh, fish and vegetables allows us to bring some of that, uh, those byproducts back as feed uh, supply for the chickens, but also allows us to aggregate and produce uh, uh, value added products uh, that would come in the form of canned products that are non-perishable so that we can expand the supply chain uh, uh, life. The transportation systems that we are now starting to engage are critical freezing facilities, uh, delivery systems, uh, uh, technical assistance, professional training, poultry production training, uh, financial management and financial access to financing, access to land, all kinds of other services that now can be scaled up so that we can support different professional sectors. The aggregation of agroforestry products, the medicinal herbs, vegetables, so that we can generate those value-added uh, products uh, rather than always just uh, the relying on selling fresh products. The grains, part of them go back into the feed meals, which go back into the uh, poultry feeding systems and so on. At the end of the day, not only managing energy from a biothermodynamics and biophysical and chemical processes standpoint, but also managing energy as we build economic systems as well. So just to give you an idea on how this way then we can actually organize systems instead of just farms. So basically that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope in this um, few minutes, um, 64 slides that I cruise you right through, we were able to create some new synapses in your, in your heads and a little bit of decolonizing, a little bit of indigenization and hopefully some awesome interaction. So we'll spend the next 25 minutes doing that. And I'll stop sharing now. That was amazing. Thank you, Rehi. I, th I want to hear your life story personally. <laughs> 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 that may be for a different time. Um, we do have a question came in right now. Uh, Mary Ellen was wondering, what variety of hazelnuts do you grow? Yeah, it's a mix between uh, native varieties and um, uh, European varieties that have been mixed um, or, or bred by mostly two farms out of Bridgerset in um, Harmony um, and uh, Mark Shepherd out of Viola. We will use Mark Shepherd's um, genetics and those are, I believe I have 10 different breeds that he developed, so it's not just one. And now we are selecting from seven of the most productive. And from that, we are creating a new nursery system. And uh, also the University of Minnesota through the Hazelnut uh, Improvement uh, Partnership have developed, uh, I believe, 10 new breeds that are now uh, being put through. In fact, Savannah Institute is part of that process. And, and we'll be bringing those into production as part of a partnership with Savannah Institute as well. So. Yeah, it's pretty diverse. We don't want to be um, uh, uh, narrowing or reducing the availability to genetics. So even though we will be using some clone materials that are being produced by the U of M, we're definitely going to use cloning material the same way you want to use debt. You don't want to be indebted to, to a system. You want to keep your debt low and your equity high. So equity for us means the diversity of genetics. Uh, that means uh, clone materials that those uh, because they literally create a, a genetic debt that we must manage carefully. And Dylan is wondering, can you describe the two paddock rotation, grazing duration, rest periods, etc? Yes, so don't think about it from a recipe perspective. Think of it from an indigenous mind. Okay, so I'm going to guide you through that process. So first of all, there is two paddocks, which we settled on uh, after experimenting from four paddocks, three paddocks, and evaluating not only labor, but also stress on the chickens because they are very homey and how they will yearn to go to the previous paddock. And they will bunch up against the fences. And so uh, we, in order to reduce the animal stress and to increase animal welfare, uh, and we measured that by evaluating mortality primarily, with four paddocks, we had the highest mortality because of the partially given to the stress that we put them through. And also because they, some of them went without food, without, without water, without us working extra to shoe them and to manage them. And we just don't want to be working too much. Uh, in my book, uh, In the Shadow of Green Man, I describe very carefully how we 
It's not like we don't work a lot, but we are allergic to it. So we want to do it the least we can. And so that settled us on two paddocks. With two paddocks, then we, we managed the orientation of the building so that we could reduce also the amount of work in that uh, and the amount of, um, of desire of the chicken to go back to the previous paddock where they were when we release them into the new one. Uh, so the orientation of the paddocks, all of that. That determines really the rotational two paddock system. Now, within those paddocks, we plant um, uh, perennial forages and we selected those based on the chicken selections. So we observed a multitude, over 50 different forages that we put out into the paddocks, into the experimental paddock, which I manage still. And in that paddock, uh, we, did, we continue to do research and development in forages. And out of that, we selected specific forages that the chickens uh, uh, prefer. None of them are grasses, except grass seeds that are sprouted. They like that, but only as sprouts, not as grown grasses. The rest of them are wide leaf, mostly a broad leaf, uh, high protein, low fiber forages, and you, we can include some of the, some of the um, uh, you know, weeds in there, mallow, pigweed, uh, lamb quarters, but above all, the, 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 the forage of, of, of choice is comfrey. Okay, now how do we rotate? All of what I just explained really determines the rotational schedule. We don't rotate on the basis of timing or periods. We base the rotation on the age of the chicken because that determines how much pressure they put. Um, and also on the regeneration capacity, regenerative capacity of the forages. So if you're starting with uh, sprouted uh, forages and your comfrey hasn't taken off yet, then your rotation schedule is going to be different than later on once the comfrey is regenerating because it regenerates really fast. And so the regeneration of the paddock and the, our observations of that regeneration is what determines when we switch the chickens back and forth. And so if it's raining a lot, like recently here, we can rotate them almost every week so that they are always on fresh uh, forage and they don't obliterate too much and expose the soil. Soil ex exposing soil is a no-no, it's part of the um, uh, protocol. And so when, when there is not raining as much and we have to keep them a little bit longer on one paddock before we rotate them to the new one, then we make sure that we spread a lot of uh, hay, straw bales, uh, so that we completely keep the, 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 the ground cover and the moisture high. And because of that, it's still roots developing and protective uh, uh, shields uh, in the soil. So the next side, then the, the other paddock starts to regenerate. If it hasn't rained a lot, we move the chickens even with small amounts of regeneration, sometimes just barely visible above the straw. But we know we have gone and, and checked it out and sampled it to make sure that there is a lot of sprouts and some of the weeds are coming back again. Some of them are very resilient. So like mallow, for example, comes back really fast because different from other weeds, the chickens don't eat the stems, they only eat the leaves. Mallow is extremely nutritional uh, and medicinal. And so, so we leave it um, and uh, we allow it, and it will, it will also regenerate faster. Um, if it's raining too much, the, it will take over. So we may have to go and weed it a little bit, you know, dig up some of the biggest uh, plants, but not, not as much as, as uh, you would think. So that's what determines the rotation. So it's really an observational process. Uh, in general, I would say, uh, you know, one and a half weeks or, or two weeks is the maximum we'll keep them in a paddock even in the, in the dry season. But when it's nice and lush, uh, we'll move them back and forth uh, every week so that they get to eat a lot more uh, fresh forage. And for the, for the case of the perennial forages like uh, comfrey, it doesn't matter how they chew them down because in the four weeks that the new flock will, will take to come out again, to start um, ro uh, foraging, the weeds in the, in the country will take over. And you, sometimes we have had to mow because of how high the regeneration has got. So there's to you the rotational, you know, crash course, rotational 101. Awesome, okay, are you ready for this one? All right, could you repeat how many birds a single farm would need to manage? 
how much does the system depend on the shared capital facilities like the mobile processor? I'm thinking about how to manage cash flow as a pioneer in my geography, geographic area. How do you manage vertebrae predators, foxes, bears, hawks, etc.? Okay, let's start with the, um, with the predators. Uh, two very different kinds of predators. You've got ground predators listed in there and you've got aerial predators. They are not managed by any you know, stretch of the imagination the same way. So the reason we put poultry back on the forest is because they are scared, literally scared uh, uh, out of the aerial predators. We, we use uh, drones to create the same exact effect that pre uh, aerial predators create on them. And we were able to get ground cameras and aerial cameras to show us the level of stress. And it's, it's, once you see that, it, it really makes you feel like that's a critical most, I mean, all day long, what you're going to worry about is aerial predators, not ground predators. Um, so the canopy, we measure it then uh, down to 60% is when the, 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 the balance broke off. So basically, in all we do, from predators uh, to biology uh, to balancing out, you know, uh, the, the, the food safety issues with salmonella and so on, what we're looking at is for a balance. In, in indigenous thinking, that's central. And so in predators, it's the same thing. How to manage predators is find a balance uh, between what they're looking for and the abilities of the chicken. The chicken is incredibly intelligent at protecting itself. It, you know, if they see a predator flying above, the first thing they do is freeze and then emit very specific sounds that are alert sounds. And so they freeze as a way to establish the, 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 the threat and then they immediately scatter to, to, um, to hide. If there is no hiding space, they're just gonna run all over the place or they just don't go out, period. That's why chickens don't roam during sunny days because even with the forest, they will pick under, you know, stay under the forest, but one, because of the shade, but second, because they can look up, they will be easy prey of aerial predators. So the canopy really eliminates 95% of the reason chickens get picked up by hawks and eagles and or all the aerial predators. The rest of it you can manage either with guard dogs or simply um, by, by keeping the production units closer to where their farm buildings are and, and predators are less likely to, to attack them uh, that way. The other thing is that all the predators, all of these predators require a takeoff and a landing, right? So the landing is, is almost eliminated by the, by the canopy, as long as you keep it above 60%. Uh, and the takeoff is completely eliminated uh, by the fact that they can't take off with the canopy above them. And so even when we have had hawks, and we observed a hawk once for over uh, 45 minutes with another agronomist on my place, we, we watched it hop from bush to bush, but never landed on the ground because he knew that from the ground it couldn't take off. He instinctively knew that. So he stayed there for about 45 minutes, hopping from bush to bush. Meanwhile, he couldn't grab a single chicken. Eventually, he just flew away and perched up above for a long time, probably meditating on its own bad law. Uh, as far as uh, um, uh, ground-based predators, foxes, um, uh, let me skip the bears. Uh, that's a whole nother story, but foxes, uh, raccoons, uh, possums, uh, coyotes, they all come at night primarily, possums and raccoons in the evenings. But by the time all of these folks come out, the chickens are tucked in in their completely sealed buildings. The building specifications are precisely developed to create uh, protection. And so uh, if the building is not built properly, they will get in, of course. Um, so that's how we control, not control. That's how we balance the relationship within us, those ground predators and the chickens during those critical hours right in the dusk, dusk time. So never wait for your, for your chickens to go all, the, all in, come out before they all go in. They know also that there will be predators. So they, our chickens, maybe one straggler will be out there at dusk, all of them going by themselves and we train them, they're in the manual. You will see there's four days of training that we use to get them into that. 
The next thing is bears, cougars, um, um, tigers. Uh, believe me, we have also developed systems to manage for those. Bears, not specifically. We have a situation right now in British Columbia. And so in British Columbia, we got this much more, <laughs> I mean, we got lynx, we got cougars, we got bears. In the northern rainforest in Belize, we actually have jaguars. Uh, those were easier. Uh, the cougars, because we don't have the same natural barriers that we have in the rainforest, we just resuscitated natural barriers that the natives and the Maya had used for you know, thousands of years to protect themselves. Uh, we just resuscitated those ancient uh, technologies. And um, up in, um, up in uh, British Columbia, the problem is that those folks are salmon people. They're not chicken people. So they really don't, didn't know much. So we still get figuring that out, but we will. Uh, applying indigenous uh, approaches, we will bring this into balance as well. I know that was a long answer, but believe me, 90% of the troubles of raising chickens, especially folks that don't want to confine them and raise them in factories, 90% uh, of their concern is going to be about predators. I, I like that the Michael smiles at the term tree range. <laughs> I was going to get there. Um, real quick, is it possible for you to send me this copy so I can disseminate it amongst everyone who's here? Other yes, yes, absolutely. Um, if I can attach, no, I can only save the chat. Okay, if I could attach, I would attach it and make it available, but I'll make it available to you right away. Wonderful, thank you. And then, yeah, if you want to go ahead and Michael's wondering, um, I'll just read it. I smile at the term tree range, but my understanding of the technical definition of free range is just a small opening where chickens can have an enclosure and enter the outside which they rarely do. Is that what you understand free range to mean? And have you thought about using pasture raised as an alternative brand? Okay, really, really important stuff. And you know, language matters a million. Language, language, language. First of all, pasture raised is an oxymoron. There is no pasture chicken. Uh, they don't eat pastures to begin with. They are not ruminants. They can't process pastures to begin with as well. Their, their, their gut system actually is designed mostly to process other kinds of uh, forages, yes, but not necessarily pasture as we understand them. So that's very important. That's why we, we didn't use pasture and we don't want to use pasture because it fundamentally violates the, the indigenous nature of the natural geoevolutionary blueprint uh, where the chicken evolved over time. Second thing is free range Yes, free range got co-opted and it was turned into this uh, way to whitewash the idea that chicken were getting uh, chickens that, I mean, consumers were getting chickens that were raised outdoors. And so free range was first exposed by, not first, but one of the big exposures that he got was Michael Pollan's uh, Omnivore's Dilemma. And so in that book, he exposed uh, Whole Foods uh, sources of chickens, uh, precisely a little door that uh, they put in, uh, into an enclosure. That's not free range. That is the way you colonize a really good idea and turn it and reduce it into a corporate whitewash that then goes out there and confuses consumers even more. And is partially the responsible for why people don't trust the, uh, a lot of the brands and the claims anymore is because, and then that's important to say because it's how corporations continue to to um, occupy our space and to whitewash it and to, and to uh, create confusion. Uh, confusion is important because then they can get away with, with, um, with just reintroducing their own stuff into areas that we have built and consumer awareness that we have created and so on. So tree range was for us a way to say, okay, a four year old can see that a chicken is raised under the trees. It's much easier, can be whitewashed. I mean, it can be uh, appropriated, of course, but that's why we trademarked it. And now we are turning it loose so that tree range can be used by anybody who respects the integrity of this design. If you respect that integrity, we will give you free access to that label. Um, and you know, maybe a little tiny little royalty so that we can pay for the legal fees. But you can imagine if a million of us farmers were to adapt that it will probably be, um, you know, 
you know, a 1.0001% of a penny per chicken sold so that we could continue to support and, 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 and to co cover the cost of a strong backbone infrastructure that will protect the integrity of something like that. That's why we use tree range. We believe that we can protect that, but we can't protect the other two. Yeah. What readings, articles would you recommend if we want to get more familiar with the idea of decolonization and indigenization? Oh, I'm going to have to send you uh, one link, one link, and that would give you probably access to many other links with integrity. In fact, let me just, just three seconds here. Okay, so uh, Google Sherry Mitchell, okay? I'm gonna plug this for Sherry Mitchell. She doesn't know who I am, but I know a lot about her. And I respect her more than almost anybody in terms of talking about decolonization. She will put you, she will send you back 3000 years to understand why we're so screwed up today. Why our society has gone to where it has gone. It's, it's, um, her book is called Sacred Instructions. This is the title, you can, you can look it up on Amazon, Sacred Instructions. And uh, her name is Sherry Mitchell. And um, uh, I'll say, I mean, aside from going through a list, there is a really important uh, interview that she just did for the Post Carbon Institute, I believe it was done for, and um, and it's just amazing. So go for that. What is your recommendation <clears throat> on the system in the global level? <clears throat> so there is over 500 million uh, farmers with under 25 hectares of land who according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization produce about 70% of the total food that is produced today. The actual food, I don't, I'm not talking about commodities like corn and soybeans that are produced in 40% of the Midwest landscape. Now, those farmers, all, 100% of them, can deploy this system and are more willing and more ready to deploy this system on a global level. Also happens that in countries in Latin America, for example, like Guatemala, there is only about 25 million chickens, egg layers, that are kept in confinement, while over 36 million hens are still in backyard flocks, in averages between 15 and 50 uh, chickens, that are the backbone of the food infrastructure and the food security of those communities that is still able to escape the massive colonizing and invasion that the Guatemalan government through the Ministry of Agriculture and sponsored by the United States and other developed countries have, cap, have uh, promoted to invade the community's bio, uh, 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 genetic wealth by, by, by giving away genetically degenerated breeds, uh, namely broilers, industrial broilers and industrial breeds that are now crossing with those native um, and more heritage breeds and destroying, obliterating the genetic diversity of communities, and at the same time, creating a massive market for imported feeds. So at the global level, with this system, I, when I was designing it, I was really envisioning those kinds of farmers, those kinds of farmers that are cataloged to be the producers of most of the food in the world today, having a chance of withstanding that massive, abusive, just violent, scale of colonizing forces that today without firing a shot and without you know maiming and, and obliterating native communities can obliterate their subsistence and their and their opportunities to survive by invading the very foundation of the food supply remember that the food supply it, whether it was the roman empire uh, or the british empires it was their food supply that was disrupted when that was disrupted they actually were uh, severely crippled and in, 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 the, in the counterinsurgency wars, uh, in the insurgency, yeah, counterinsurgency wars like the Contras and the Guatemalan, uh, the support of the U.S. especially with the Guatemalan military 
the food systems of the indigenous peoples were the highly, the first targets, no different than during the Spanish invasions of Mexico, uh, Hernán Cortés targeted the, the Amaranth fields of the Aztec. Similar to that, the, the U.S. military, uh, uh, through the Guatemalan military and the U.S. oligarchs and the United Food Company and all of those folks, uh, uh, targeted the Guatemalan food systems, the native food system, by targeting the cornfields and the uh, bean fields and, the, and, and those places where the food came from. Today, that same strategy is at work, but it's at work through uh, invading the genetic diversity of a lot of our communities. So my intention was that through, by bringing back all of the ancient technology and ways of thinking and doing and engineering and all of that, merging it and marrying it with some of the more sophisticated ways that we learn in agriculture school on how to use the, the laws of thermodynamics and, and biophysical chemical management of the earth ecosystems that we can actually bring a potential opportunity to reinvigorate the, the insurgent nature of indigenous uh, communities across the world, those, in, those communities that still think from an indigenous perspective. And my hope is that we can unite native communities that are still fighting for the indigenous rights across the world and hopefully use the chicken as a, as a uh, marching cry and to restore that fundamental sovereignty that is necessary so that you can anchor an actual global insurgency so that we can actually build what many have called food revolution but have not provided methodology and specific instructions on how to do it. I am in the, in the final touches of the 14 chapter publication where we will lay this out so that we can actually take back these systems that belong to us. That's my intention for the global application and recommendations for this system. When can we look forward to that publication? Yeah, it's taken a while and I just haven't been willing to put it out until it's ready. And I, but I also, so that there's more people ready. Right now I have 2000 requests. So maybe you want to put the request through the Savannah Institute. I want to partner with every one of these partner organizations to make this publication available uh, across the board and then build a platform, which we are building right now. Uh, you know, uh, as you go forward, um, this is not available yet online, but um, I'm going to type it in the comments, regen poultry.com. Um, you can't access it because it won't let you. It's not yet live, but it's almost finished being built. All of this um, is, is literally a MOOC. Um, and so it will be available online, not for free. I can't make it for free, available for free, but we will work on the scholarships so that people can have access. And for those cases where communities can gather together, we can make it available to whole communities at the same price of an individual somewhere else so that they can, um, so that this uh, MOOC can be then spread out. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna read the next question. What are the challenges you are facing during this pandemic period in your production system? I mean, the production system is not affected by the pandemic. Um, basically, you know, one or two uh, people can operate a farm that produces 32 to 42,000 broilers. So with maybe one person coming in or two people coming in sporadically, but social distancing, all of that is 100% manageable uh, within the production process. Now the challenges are in the processing uh, facilities, as you have heard, um, meat packers, whether it's pork, beef, or chicken, are really the epicenters of a lot of the rural um, spread of COVID-19. Uh, literally, that's how COVID-19 spread to rural communities. And so we, we purchased, you know, during the, during the pandemic, uh, since it started in the middle of it, we purchased a processing facility out of Stacyville, Iowa, which are, we are in the middle of planning uh, for the deployment. And so the deployment of that facility would allow us to test new ways of managing the, the way we protect people, visitors, um, uh, in, in the context of um, a virus of this uh, uh, magnitude. There are strategies. We are agronomists. We have dealt with biosecurity our whole lives. We have been successfully doing that for, for decades. So managing biological agents is not something we're 
we are newer, so we know we will succeed, but it is still a challenge mostly because uh, too many people are not taking the threat seriously and they then become a threat to the rest of us who are trying to do our best. That's really the biggest challenge, not, not a challenge of our own, but a challenge of other folks out there who are irresponsibly uh, politicizing this issue. And as a result of that, uh, creating more polarization and confrontations that are so detrimental, so denigrating and so non-productive and so non-productive even in the context of trying to reopen everything. That's exactly the reason we're having to still shut things down because you know, of that lack of seriousness. That's the biggest challenge. We, and there's one more, repeat the truck manufacturer of the processing truck. Is it made in the US and what is the cost? Yeah, the, the processing truck I showed you, that was not made in the US. No, actually, I'm sorry. It was made in the US out of the North, Northwest um, and it was bought by a university in Calgary, exported, and then they couldn't use it because they didn't have enough production. They, they didn't think about the production of chickens before they bought the processor. So it sat there for two years, processed I think three or four times, 1500 birds at the time. And they put it up for sale. So we bought it and re-imported it to the US. We bought that unit for very, very cheap. It's a $320,000 unit new that we bought for $150,000. And we bought it because we needed a processor in Pine Ridge. Their closest processor is over 250 uh, miles away. That means 500 mile round, round trip. That, was, that would kill the operation. So we figured, okay, for that money, we can just buy the processor, bring it over, instead of um, trying to, to scale up the, the production first. And um, basically we, we now have uh, a group of, uh, farmers that are, you know, producing and consuming uh, and making chicken available right there in the Pine Ridge. So that's one. Now, they're, they're processing, um, uh, if you want to order, order a uh, processing facility, uh, check Cornerstone Ventures, uh, I believe they, or check, um, oh man, I'm going to have to send you the, um, the um, link to Bob Lauder, I don't remember the name of his company, but it's a manufacturing company out of the Northwest that produced that unit and they are really experienced at it. They can make you a unit that is USDA, you know, inspectable, but in, in definitely state inspectable. Um, there is a question there about, um, so again, cost, you could build one if you, if you are, you know, handy, they are not really that difficult to build. I suggest you don't, you don't do the, 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 the kill, plucking, uh, scalding and plucking, that you do that outside of the unit. And then you have a connection, you have this unit, you, this space enclosed still, but you can use a greenhouse for that, as long as you can keep flies and other, um, and other potential uh, uh, threats to your um, biological control out of that space. And then, in the, but you can make the, the, the area where you, you do the kill, the bleeding, the, the scalding and the plucking outside of the more expensive part, which is the, the evisceration and that paste that has to be completely uh, clean and inert. And so that way you don't put money into a big facility, very expensive space where you're gonna do the dirty work, so to speak, of killing, plucking and scalding. All the units are built that way. I don't really understand why, because it's not a requirement and it is really a waste of a very expensive uh, square footage. Um, so that w I, I hope that, um, that this company will produce as one of those units under our new specs and that that will reprice it and hopefully it will be more affordable. As far as OFO, is a, if you are doing uh, mobile processing, more likely you will be keeping most of the chicken that means you are not discarding feet, neck, heart, liver, and gizzards. So you are only discarding feathers and uh, guts. And honestly, the amount of offal that, offal that you produce out of that is minimal. Um, I produce, I process chickens here right on my farm. I only own 1.9 acres. 
I produce 700 bird flocks. Somebody had asked about the size of the flocks. They are 1,500 birds per flock on a full unit. A unit is a chicken, a chicken coop with at least one square footage, one square foot per chicken, and at least 40 square feet of ranging space outdoors. That makes it at 1,500, a 1,500 square foot building, uh, 20 foot by about 90 long, and um, 1.5 acres of ranging space. So there you have your spec for your unit and about 1,000 hazelnuts and roughly four to, um, 40 to 50 uh, uh, higher canopy trees like oaks and walnuts if you want to get some quick canopy and then cut them later. And then if you want canopy sooner than the hazelnuts can develop, which take up to five years, then you can put uh, some of the Northern Hemisphere elderberries, specifically ranch and um, John's varieties. Those two will grow thicker stems, taller canopy, produce bigger, not, uh, bigger fruit. You can harvest the fruit, but also will give you a canopy within the first season. By the fall, you'll have a canopy, and the next season, you start with a full canopy. Don't coppice it. Those varieties don't like being coppiced anyway, so they are perfect in medium canopy, and then you can cut them later once the hazelnuts have developed, because the hazelnuts have more value at the end of the day. So that gives you some, some solid backing there. As far as the offal, we have uh, that layer system that I showed you. We can use that same layering system um, for, for uh, processing the offal. When we, I showed you a picture in the presentation of, this, of the plucker. The plucker was shooting the feathers in one direction. Uh, th that water is very clean. The water, you can just let it run. There is nothing bad about it. Um, in fact, by the time you know, it reaches eight feet from the plucker, it's just like, water that went through your roof after falling through leaves and, and other things outside. So, but you notice that the, the feathers were, la were landing on top of a very thick layer of straw. So that way, any, any material, any, any skin, the feathers and everything are landing on the straw and the straw is then filtering out all of that organic matter. Then we bring that straw and layer it. So we will put a layer of straw with feathers then we will put a full layer of just straw. Then we'll put a layer of soil on top of that. Then, and the soil is critical, then we will put a layer of uh, actual guts on top of that mixed with straw as well. Then another very thin layer of soil. Then a thin, a, a thick layer of organic matter. It can be wood chips, it can be leaves, it can be more straw. And then we, on top of that, we will layer uh, they, we will spray the, the, the blood that, that was left over. The blood, we would put it completely on top, um, the, the guts right above the feathers. And then, you know, in the next spring, um, we will turn that over a few times. And by the time you're done, you can't find even the feathers completely disappear. That's the only place where we actually turn the, the compost pile is on the offal. But if you, if you want to be more sophisticated about it, what you do then is do the same thing, but build a cement floor and then uh, a roof and then monitor the humidity. And then you can spray it so that you can actually have a, a completely USDA or a certifiable uh, compost product at the end of the day. It's beautiful, it smells really good. Um, and you can never tell it came from an offal. Wow. Egg layers. Yeah, I mean, I got, I got time. So if you guys okay. are sticking around, there's only 11 people. So that means we got, we have less seven, lost seven, but um, for you. Jason's still there. The egg layer system is, is vastly different. Number one, the layer ranges many times longer, farther and longer than the broiler. So the broiler needs more feed and more water closer and also doesn't walk as far. A few of them stragglers will, but we calculated no more than 10% of a broiler breed that is a slow growth. So they still got a lot of heritage characteristics. Those are the only ones we use. We, don't, we, don't, we never use uh, industrial broilers um, in the tree range brand. Um, if a client wants them under our system, we definitely will, will find somebody to grow them broilers, uh, industrial broilers. Um, but we'll never make it into the tree range brand because that we'll, we'll lose that. Um, so for the egg layer, 
the other thing is that you don't want to use, do smaller flocks. Uh, the biggest flock we can do in broilers is 1500. Above that, the, the social behavior start deteriorating significantly and we start getting a lot more mortality, less animal welfare and all kinds of other complications. And it's also, they also don't roam as far, as far which over concentrates the chickens in specific areas. And that can potentially generate oversaturation and the potential leaching of nutrients into the soil. So that balance of 1500 took us over three years to reach that space. And even now we noticed that when we, one year we didn't have chickens in the paddocks and the next year the apples didn't do as well. We put the chickens back the next year and everything, everything took off again. So it, it's very balanced. The nutrition is not excessive. We use the plants as indicators. And this year we are doing really deep soil sampling. With the egg layers, you got a lot more freedom to work with. And so because of that, we can do larger flocks, which is very important because we are looking for efficiencies as well, mechanical efficiencies. And you can't reach mechanical efficiencies with tiny flocks that you gotta be handling back and forth. So with the egg layers, we went upwards of 2000 egg layers per flock. We tested this system in 2016 in Mexico in a high land dry area with only 12 to 16 inches of rain a year distributed only within four, four and a half months, very extreme conditions. Just the same way we tested the brothers in Minnesota because we wanted to test the extreme conditions of spring and fall when it gets very cold and wet as well. So we pushed the system to the edge first uh, with over 2,000 broilers, and then we balanced it out of 1,500. We pushed the chicken, the egg layer to the edge as well with 2,000 egg layers, and then we balanced it out about 1,500 for highland dry regions like that, that don't regenerate fast, and around 2,000 per flock here in the Midwest, we got much more generous uh, environmental conditions. And then we doubled the units. So you have, instead of having one production, one flock, we put two flocks in the same building, don't mix them. So basically that allows us to use industrial level technology for feeding, watering, and collecting the eggs because we have one flock on one side with their solarium and all of these new things that we put in on, through the regenerative engineering process. We have solar, passive solar heating systems, sprouting system inside that space in the winter, all of those things that industrial systems just don't care for. Um, and at the same time, up to seven acres uh, of paddock ranging area, seven and a half acres, so that they can roam on larger spaces in the summer. And then, and then we back it up against another unit on the other side so that we can then collect the eggs automatically, mechanically in the center, but the flocks are still at 2,000 maximum per flock on each side and with their own large scale ranging areas with twice the space of ranging than we use for broilers. That means we use 80 square foot per hen on their space outdoors and that's plenty sufficient for them to not only range large scale, they literally these chickens, they range as much as they want. There is no restriction. Even though we have a perimeter fence, the perimeter fence, they only use it as a reference. It doesn't mean they can't run, you know, fly, jump, whatever they want to do, they can do it as much as they want because there is no real uh, restriction of their freedom. Um, so. Any comments on the hazard mitigating aspects of chicken based silvopastoralism, moisture retention, flood control, when it is, it is adopted at the local regional landscape level, not just the farm level? Hazard mitigation aspect. I, I don't know what hazards I would be I'll be looking for, feel free to add a comment there, John. Um, I don't know what hazards, I don't have any hazards to talk about. Um, moisture retention, flood control. I don't really know that what that is about because we want moisture retention in the soil. In fact, we optimize it. Um, oh, extreme weather, yes. So we have had super hot days. Um, uh, about 115 index, heat index uh, with high humidity. I mean, absolutely repressive. And yet we have to see chickens having any, any extreme reaction to it because basically the temperature under the canopy 
and because of the of the the way we manage that understory, it has full air circulation. All they do is they just sit on the ground, and the ground is 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 really cool because it, it's never been exposed to direct sun. So the temperature of the ground is still at around 70, 72, 73, 74 degrees, so that they're able to just release all that extra heat. Uh, we barely, uh, rarely see panting chickens even in those extreme days, because again, the, the system was built to, to protect them against that. And then during the, um, the night in the buildings, we have uh, fans that have been calculated to remove the air and circulate it up to four or five times per hour. So we have a, a high level of air movement through with a ventilation system that draws low, low to the ground air and exhausts it high of, off the ground so that we are actually replacing that air continuously inside the coops. Also the, the ventilation system is installed in a way so that it actually removes almost 100% of the air but almost from 100% of the space, not just from the specific corners, because in the, at the very beginning, we had in those cases, um, uh, in, in some of those cases with extreme hot weather at night uh, and humidity, and especially when it was storming on top of being high humidity and, um, and high heat. And then so the, the chickens would stampede to the corners. And if when those corners were not properly ventilated, we had suffocation issues and we would lose a handful of birds overnight on those corners. One time we lost 300 because before we had rigid walls, uh, the flapping of the, of the walls that we were trying to make in the buildings cheaper. So we use, um, do we use hoop houses and the hoop houses became a hazard during those extreme conditions. And so even though they don't happen often, they do happen. And when they happen, you can have a mass mortality. So we don't want to be dealing with that of when the storm and the heat and all of that actually hits. So we modified the buildings and now we use rigid buildings instead, um, so on. So we have really fine-tuned the system for a lot of those things. On the opposite end, with egg layers, which doesn't happen with, with broilers because we don't keep the broilers in the winter. Instead, we are building partnerships south of us uh, in the warmer climate states so that we can compensate for the production in the upper part of the Midwest during the winter. Instead of fighting nature, we're trying to modify our strategy. Now, in the winter with egg layers, you absolutely have to cap half them indoors. And so because of that, we developed over three years, we, we tested uh, technology that was developed by, by um, rest in peace, uh, Chuck Weibel, and now uh, promoted by, by his wife, surviving wife, and the garden goddess technology of underground piping systems to harvest heat during the day, heat the ground, and then use that at night. That works much better for broilers and, and I mean for chickens than it works for vegetables. With vegetables, your temperature has to be up above 65, 70 degrees. Only a few vegetables, 16 or 18 vegetables, actually do okay in lower temperatures like 65, but the chickens are perfectly happy at 45 and 50 degrees. So that technology served as beautifully for, for the year round nature of uh, egg layers. So we, we will not grow egg layers we will not raise egg layers here and, uh, without that properly installed. We tested the egg laying system here too. Uh, in fact, the year I tested the egg layer system was that year when the Niagara Falls froze over, the Northern Caves in, in Minnesota froze over. I believe hell froze over that year probably. And so that's the year we had 50 days in a row with no, no temperatures above 20, minus 20 degrees, and most of them minus 30. Um, poultry farmers in our region spent all of their earnings on gas, heating their barns, and they still lost a lot of chickens. That's the year we tested our system. And I am happy to report, we passed the test, the stress test, and when we build the, the egg laying system going forward now, which we will, we will build it at a scale that is minimum 4,000 egg layers per unit, and no more than three or four units at the start so that we can actually populate a minimum processing facility that can be collectively owned. So yes, as far as the processing facilities, whether they are mobile or fixed, the idea is to have collective ownership and control. That is the decolonization way. How many years to pay for a one barn system when you get your return on investment? Well, it depends on how smart you are about managing money, I would say. 
I can tell anybody, I will never talk to anybody about how much profits they can make and when they will get the investment back. I mean, some people are really frugal and they will get their barn cost, the whole investment back really quickly. Some others are really wasteful and I can't tell you to be or not to be wasteful uh, or to be smart about money. Some people buy extra stuff that they don't need. I can't tell them not to. And all of that is going to have a direct impact on how long it will take for them to get the money back. But if you ask me, seven years is more than enough to get my money back, uh, especially because, uh, well, if I, well, selling wholesale my poultry on the farm uh, through the tree range system, I still get well paid decently, but and I, I prefer to do that because then I'm part of a collective rather than individually trying to fend for myself as a farmer. But that doesn't mean I can't keep some of my chickens because tree range is not a system that is going to come and enslave us like the conventional contract farming does. Uh, so that means I got freedom. I, I own my chickens, so I can keep some of them, but, I can't, but tree range will make sure that I am not left with chickens I don't want uh, or I can't market. So if I will market direct, I can double my margins and then get my money back faster that way. It's up to how you are, where you are, your location, how much, how good you are marketing, whether you are preferring to do that or to go straight to the, to the wholesale and just take a break instead of being always you know, nailed to the farm. That's the thing with animal agriculture. So that's why I, I like broilers because I can take, you know, if I don't want to do a flock, I don't have to do a flock. And that's why we are spreading this system out so that the, the tree range system is always going to be supplied, whether I take a break or not, whether I have an incident or not, whether my chickens die or not. All of those factors are, are factoring into the cell nature, the cellulosic, cell-based nature. And fragmentation strategy is critical in this case. Ecological management, fragmentation is to be avoided. In, in economic resiliency and insurgency-based strategies, fragmentation is the key to being able to fight large forces that want to attack you. So we have kept all of that really valuable, um, you know, war time that I had to survive through and the lessons that we learned in terms of fighting large scale forces that can be overwhelming if you don't know how to defend yourself. And this is kind of what we brought into the design, the agronomics, the economic structure and the ownership and control, the way we are organizing the outer layers of our system now so that we'd eventually organize the inner layers, which include larger scale infrastructure and so on, but also with the outer layers fully in control of the inner layers. Those are ancient methodologies for organizing insurgencies that are now part of the Mayan re regeneration projects that we are deploying both in Guatemala and here in Omaha, Nebraska, using some of that uh, Mayan um, uh, organizing processes that survived the wars and survived colonization and all of that kind of annual for how many? Okay, annual forages. Listen, um, most forages are okay as long as, as, long as they are broad leaf. Uh, clover, uh, you know, read, read specific um, characteristics of uh, some of them. Like clover, for example, is known to produce um, uh, female hormones in males. And so, so in pigs, you want to be careful with that. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe you don't want to be careful. Uh, that's up to you and how you see it. I just want animals to express themselves uh, fully and, and whatever your sexual orientation is, you should be able to express yourself fully. And <laughs> manipulating that is not something I'm in the business of. So because of that, some of these forages uh, have to be managed carefully. Some others have poisons, um, but most of the animals, in this case, if you are not using Cornish broilers, uh, the animals actually are able to discern. Uh, they, they know which ones are and which ones are not as good for them. But in general, you can use mallow, purslin. Um, you can put uh, sprouted beans, definitely. Not soybeans, sorry. Edible beans, not soybeans. Uh, but everything from peas to, to uh, black beans to all kinds of other uh, dry edible beans. Uh, things you can make soups with. Um, and if you use soybeans for soups, don't use it for the chickens, just, just keep it to yourself. Um, the other thing is widely forages like, like mallow, of course, I said that before, um, um, pigweed is an amaranth, so it's an extremely highly valuable, it's high nutrition forage, and the seeds are even more nutritious. Um, then you have uh, comfrey, 
Comfrey is by far our favorite. It really uh, uh, increased the, the, the animal welfare conditions, which we measure by the mortality rates. Uh, until we introduced Comfrey, we normally accepted 5% mortality, even though you know, folks who have free-ranging chickens, free-ranging chickens were real, not, not the, the little door things that we're talking about, but folks were actually letting them out loose and all that. And um, they, they considered 10, 15% uh, acceptable. We were using 5% as acceptable. Now we are containing down to 3%, 2% in the case of the last flock I raised, we only lost 2% chicken. That's absolutely way out there. It's an outlier flock, but uh, it was possible because we brought in medicinal herbs, especially comfrey, and started incorporating medicinal herbs into the water system. So there's to you, um, regenerative poultry, decolonization, and indigenization. Thank you so much, Rehi. This was amazing, enlightening, and inspiring. Um, thank you for all the work that you do, and so honored to have you as a part of this webinar series. So, really. Yeah, thanks for the chance. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and have a wonderful evening. Um, Rehi's going to send me the presentation, so I'll make that available for everyone, and then I'll also post this on our Facebook and our YouTube so you can rewatch it again and gain even more knowledge. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Bello and Dylan and John and Gary and Rosina, everybody who who's took the time to write notes there. Appreciate that. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great night.